The following program is the work of the broadcast students of the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland, which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. woman's condo has been flooded for months, and she says no one's listening. One man petitions to change the date of BC's Family Day. And gaming glasses that can save your posture. Welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Tara Harvey. And I'm Chris Brentlinger-Grant. We begin today with news from here on our campus. As Burnaby RCMP confirmed, they're investigating a peeping Tom situation that happened at BCIT in November. Many students are now wondering why they didn't find out until now. Jason Chia She Yong was arrested after he allegedly was filming male students in the washroom by using a cell phone and mirror. We did communicate with the community last night from our president's office to ensure that they're aware that moving forward we will ensure they're communicated in a timely fashion. Police allege a man used a mirror and a cell phone to secretly record students in the male washroom. Jason Chia She Yang has been arrested. Now over to Surrey. A woman has been living in a flooded condo for three months now. She claims the leak would have been fixed by now if the condo strata was cooperating. Travis Prasad has the story. It first started with water coming through the ceiling. And since then, the water has seeped through the walls and into the floors. This fan, the lone defense against a damp living room. The condition of my home is completely unlivable. It's been falling apart and flooding since November. The only space available in my entire condo has been on this couch, day in and day out. Lund's bedroom has no heating and is missing insulation. The walls and floors both wet. She says the damage to her home could have been avoided if the condo strata was willing to help. They refuse to deal with me. Although I am paying funds out of my account that gets directly taken out of my bank account from Premier Strata. So I don't understand why this is taking over three months to deal with. Lund says it should be the strata's job to fix the leak because it's coming from the balcony. The strata is responsible to repair and maintain the common property at all times. And common property is the building envelope that keeps the outside from the inside. So if you've got water coming through that envelope, it is their responsibility um, to deal with that. We tried reaching Premier, the strata company that manages Tall Timbers condos, but our phone calls and emails went unanswered. All of Lund's belongings are packed in boxes to keep them dry. She says her condo no longer feels like home. It's not right, it's not fair, not morally, not ethically, no way, shape or form is this the way to leave anybody. There's got to be somebody responsible and I want to know who it is. Lund is now getting a lawyer in hopes of unpacking her things sooner rather than later. Travis Prasad in Surrey for BCIT Magazine. Travis Prasad joins us now. So Travis, it seems like the strata has failed to fix the leak. Will they have to pay for the damage to the condo? Yeah, well, while that seems logical, it isn't the case. Phil Dugan, the strata lawyer you just heard from in the story, says that all strata had to do in this situation is hire a contractor to fix the leak. Now, if the contractor fails to fix the leak, the owner of the condo unit has to take it up with the contractor, not strata. Dugan says that Strata is not legally liable for any damage that happens inside any of the condo units. So you're saying the owner will have to pay for the repairs, not the tenant? Yes and no. Rosanna Lund is in a rent-to-own agreement in this condo. So what that means is every month when she pays her rent, she's putting some of her own equity into the condo. Now, Dugan says this makes her a part owner of the unit and therefore she's legally liable for the repairs. Back to you. Thanks, Travis. 
A petition to change the date of BC Family Day has gained some serious traction. And with the holiday coming up later this month, the man behind it all hopes to get some attention from the provincial government. My co-anchor Tara Harvey has the story. <laughs> Andrew Johns believes Family Day should be just that, a day with the ones you love. That's why he has started a petition to change the date of BC's holiday to coincide with the rest of the country. Knowing that there are families who are interprovincial uh, or families who have um, a mom or dad who's working in a job like I am, I do, where you've got to work on BC Family Day because of either the financial markets in my case or if you're a federal employee, you're going to be working on Family Day in BC and then you won't have to work on Family Day the following week when it's a holiday rest the across the rest of the country. The petition has gained traction with over 16,000 signatures, but John says he wants more. The province, when they did their consultative process back in 2012, uh, they, they had 17,000 names that came in favor of the second Monday in February. So a lot of questions I get, a lot of times I get asked, and what number do you want, aspire to achieve? And I'd love us to get past 17,000. Following the announcement of BC's Family Day, Premier Christy Clark said in a press release, having the holiday on the second Monday would create opportunities for BC families and local businesses, and that British Columbians would be able to enjoy local attractions with fewer lineups and less out-of-town traffic. Four years later, and opinions seem to vary. Sometimes it does affect me and you know on the business side of things, um, but you know probably not to the point that it's a huge impact. It just doesn't really matter. I mean, as long as there's some day for Family Day, then I guess that's all that really matters. I work for a national company with offices right across Canada, and it's a very inconvenient when when we have staggered uh, uh, public holidays. Johns understands that there are economic benefits to the current date, but says the social aspect is really what it's all about. Ultimately, what's going to make the government make the decision to change this is if we can get you know, bundles and bundles of people getting their voice out. We need the support of everybody in the province that believes in this initiative. Tara Harvey in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. It's called Tech Neck or Game Boy Back, and it's a problem for kids who play too many video games. Thanks to a local doctor, kids may have a way to keep playing without hurting their posture. Estefania Duran has more. These may look like ordinary glasses at first, but they're designed specifically with one goal in mind, gaming. So I do have three kids, and uh, as a physician, I noticed that uh, they're spending a lot of time playing with electronic devices and um, from a um, medical point of view their positions was not correct. So they were hunching forward for hours a day, day after day. They're called the iForcer. Put them on and connect wirelessly. Open the app to sync the glasses and then play your favorite game. If the glasses detect slouching, a warning pops up. Too many warnings and the game shuts down. So the eye forcer makes it easier because it's wearable and when children are slouched, it will give them a warning. This all started with actually a chair, but when they realized that this was going to be something very difficult to take with you everywhere, they decided to make it more wearable. I believe it was after six or seven prototype where that we came up with this concept. The eye forcer measures slouching through sensors. As the posture becomes poor, the head is moving forward and as the head is moving forward there is more pressure on the back of the spine. So as an example for every one inch of head forward movement the pressure or the force on the spine will double. Parents will have a password for the app so they can decide how long their kids can play and which games. All these can be adjusted by parents choices. So this could be 45 and the warning duration before ending the app could be 10. The way you treat your spine, you know, the first 15, 16 years of your life, uh, it will determine uh, how your posture will be the rest of your life. The app should be on the market by the end of the year for Android, and the Apple version will soon follow. Estefania Duran in Richmond for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, Vancouver firefighters are asking the city for more resources. And a local artist auctions her work over social media for a good cause. 
A defining moment for me was when I finished my first internship and got lots of really great feedback from industry professionals. I would have never imagined I'd be walking into the floors of TSN and thinking, I'm not a student anymore, I'm here to work. I will be starting a job with an investigative news program in Toronto and I'm really excited to see that grow into what will become hopefully my dream job. BCIT broadcast and online journalism, putting you to work. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. Well, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. The Vancouver Firefighters Union is looking to Mayor Gregor Robertson for solutions to its funding issues. Emily Murray has more. This is a medical response fire truck. It's one of only two firefighting vehicles in Kitsilano. And over this past weekend, it was taken out of service. The reason? The Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services says it's due to a staff shortage. But the firefighters union says otherwise. Yeah, I think the real problem is we have a fire chief that puts um, budget pressures over the safety of its citizens. Certainly we wouldn't have had an issue at all getting somebody to fill that spot either on Friday night or Sunday day. The union stated that one rig was already lost out of Carisdale. The loss of this second truck in Kitsilano now poses a serious risk to Vancouverites living in the densely populated west side of the city. Vancouver Fire and Rescue said in an email the issue to which you're referring is not one our office is able to comment on at this time, for a number of reasons. These are men and women that put their life on the line for their fellow citizens, and what we're asking for in return is some consideration for our safety on scene, and certainly the safety of the public we're there to serve. The union is expecting a response from the city in the coming days. Emily Murray in Kitsilano for BCIT Magazine. We're now joined by Emily Murray. Emily, has the city inquired about staffing at Vancouver Fire Halls? Well, Chris, in 2010, the city actually forked out $400,000 to conduct a study that stated Vancouver firefighters actually need a staff increase. And how are Vancouver firefighters responding? The Vancouver Firefighters Union says they just want the right tools to do their job properly, and they're hopeful that the city will listen. Back to you. Thanks, Emily. The Academy Awards are being held on February 28th. Our producer, Lena Tanahara, sat down with film critic Lisa Cothard on who should win on the big night. So Lisa, let's start with the acting categories first. Who do you think is going to win Best Actress? I think it's going to be Brie Larson for Room. She won the Screen Actors Guild Award. I'm She's been be getting a lot of buzz. It's an emotionally harrowing role and it calls on a lot for an actress because she really doesn't have a co-star to bounce off of. There is the young boy, but it really is her on screen by herself in many ways for much of the film. And to portray the kinds of trauma that that character goes through is very difficult. And on the male side, who do you think is going to win for Best Actor? I think it's definitely going to be Leonardo DiCaprio for The Revenant, and I'm rarely this sure about who wins, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be him. He won the Screen Actors Guild. Leonardo DiCaprio has been a favorite in Hollywood for many years, and he has many Oscar nominations, but he's actually never won. So this role was talked about early on as the role that's going to get him an Oscar. And again, it is of an emotionally difficult role. He's in the middle of the woods for much of it, but trying to survive, not uh, with anyone else, and even for part of the film, his character is virtually mute. He can't even speak. He's that injured. So you have a character who's really a performance that's really focusing on facial expressions, gestures, and calls on all the skills that an actor has. And what about Best Director, then? Best Director, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to suggest that it's going to be George Miller for Mad Max. That's a surprising choice, almost. It's very mainstream. It is mainstream. Mad, Mad Max ha does have several nominations, but they're most, mostly in the costuming, special effects departments. 
But George Miller, I think, will get the Oscar because it is this recognition of his career rather than just a single film. He did the original Mad Max. He's been around a lot in Hollywood. And it really is interesting to see a director go back and do a prequel to their own work in this way. And I think that's very interesting, and I think he'll get the win for that. And finally, the most coveted prize, Best Picture. Best Picture, I think we're going to see a bit of a surprise this year, because often Best Picture is the same film as what won Best Director, or that one of the acting awards goes to. But I think this year, I think the Best Picture will be either Spotlight or The Big Short. And why this film? I think, and I'm leaning towards Spotlight, and I think Spotlight because it is a socially significant film, and it's a newspaper film. Hollywood loves newspaper films, and it ties into this idea of investigation, justice, setting things right for the record, and I think there's a lot of appeal for that, and I think the awards are going to want to reward the film for that kind of social significance of its message. And this year's Oscars, um, they have come under a lot of criticism for its lack of diversity. Could you speak on that? The lack of diversity is, in fact, really notable, especially if we contrast it to the Screen Actors Guild Awards, which had a much more diverse range of nominations and wins. Um, in part, that's because I think television is more hospitable to diversity than film currently is. American, contemporary American cinema has become exceedingly white. So I would be in line with what Spike Lee says here, that the problem is not just who was nominated for the Oscars, but the problem is one of what films are being made in Hollywood today and what are the roles for African Americans, Latinos, and other people other than just white people. Um, and there's also the makeup of the Academy itself which is dominantly white, and it has also in recent years been criticized for being above middle age, so a little bit out of touch with what a lot of people are going to the movies for. So I think we need to see a shift in the way the Academy works and a shift in filmmaking as well as a shift in the Oscars to focus on diversity more. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Back to you. Thanks, Elena. A local artist is combining her talents with social media. Sophia Pirani has more. Meet Marissa Powell, a local artist who has challenged herself to paint 100 watercolors in 100 days to raise money for BC's environment. She kick-started the project on January 1st by inviting eco-minded locals to submit their photos and stories describing one small action they do to help the environment. Now, with a month of momentum under her canvas, she's opening it up to the public to participate. Being able to recognize those folks in our community that are doing something really dedicated and unique with their life and don't always get the recognition um, for it. So it's been really cool to just take a moment and listen to people's stories and that sort of thing. It's kind of what I'm interested in is how can we live really, really rich, abundant lives, but still be making like daily actions that support um, the wild places we care about. By tagging Marissa on Instagram and using the hashtag this wild road, she is then able to pick her photo of the day. Formatting it to a small square, she then auctions the painting on her page with 50% of proceeds going towards Pacific Wild, an organization she admires for their dedication towards our province. Well, one of the big challenges for a small group like ours is to find ways for everybody to contribute, which is why we were so excited about Marisa's project. Whatever amount it is, and keen to work with her to make sure that the donation goes towards a, a project that she feels passionately about. With 68 days left in her initiative, Marissa is sure that she will be able to make a valuable impact with her artwork. Sophia Pirani in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Coming up next on BCIT Magazine, a charity project continues to grow thanks to three local women. And the BC Lions introduced their coaching staff for the upcoming season. I chose BCIT because I know that all the programs are very hands-on. We have our own radio station, like it's, it's one of the best programs that I've ever heard of. 
I am starting a job on Monday, so confidence is high. Uh, honestly, I didn't think it was going to be this fun. Standby graphics, ready camera one. If you want to experience the fast-paced world of news. Today on BCIT Magazine. Striking. Make magic on a movie set. Frame. And action. Or bring your creative ideas to life. BCIT's hands-on training will get you started. BCIT Television and Video Production. Your possibilities start here. Did you know BCIT has a 77-seat planetarium right behind me in SW3? Grab a pillow, lie back, and soar into the stars with David Bowie on the Sweet Sound System. Showtimes are every Friday and Saturday night. Celebrate the Year of the Monkey at the Lunar New Year Festival hosted by UBC's Asian Studies program this Friday. Catch the line dance at 10 a.m., followed by student performances and a traditional lunch at noon. See and hear the sensuous dance of tango with the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra at the Orpheum this Friday, February 5th at 8 p.m. Thanks for watching. That was this week's community calendar. Three local women are giving away supplies to help those in need stay warm over the winter. Estefania Duran has the story. These are all strangers. Volunteers who've come together to keep others warm as part of the Get Warm project. The project started five years ago by two sisters and their best friend. I got started with the project because Shauna, Sarah and I saw a need for it and we felt like it was our responsibility to do something about it. The three Vancouverites started by giving away their own clothes. Then the project grew and others got on board. It just got to the point where all of our sharing online really tapped into people who are looking for opportunities to, to contribute or to help out in different ways. And every single outreach day, we have different faces that we might not have ever seen before. Today, the group is preparing more than 100 bundles of blankets, mittens, socks, food, and toiletries. These outreach days happen twice a month from November to February. Each winter, they hand out more than a thousand bundles, making a difference to many in the downtown east side. The fear of like this separateness between us and them is really uh, eliminated in, in the experience of when people get to hand a warm blanket to a complete stranger. Volunteers always go to the corner of Maine and Hastings to give away the bundles. It, it wouldn't be right not to help or not to do something when you can. Um, I think inherently most people are good and they want to help. Um, so I, I think it's just the right thing to do. And they will continue to help because they can. This will probably be in some capacity going on for our little family for years. It's just I think it's part of our who we are as a family and who we are as people. Their last outreach day of the year will be on Sunday, February 21st. Estefania Duran in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. The BC Lions 2016 coaching staff has been officially installed and it's a bit of a throwback. Emily Murray has the story. I believe they're going to be an extension of um, myself and the BC Lions in creating uh, units that will make this football club uh, you know, competitive and will make this football club uh, what we want it to be. It seems as though Wally Buono is getting his old gang back together for the BC Lions upcoming season. The coaching staff was formally introduced by Buono, who, as previously announced, will be returning to the role of both general manager and coach. Highlights of the staff include the return of Kahari Jones, a former Lions quarterback who will be the offensive coordinator after serving as receivers coach last season. Jones was excited to announce Dan Durazio, another familiar face, as his O-line coach. As good as, uh, of an O-line coach as, as there is and uh, pays great attention to detail and very happy to have him back with me and that's uh, Dan Durazio. Durazio helped coach the Lions in 2003. During his career, he has seen six trips to the Grey Cup, winning four. A trend Buono hopes stays with the Lions. We have to uh, you know, build a football team uh, you know, that's going to be competitive, uh, that's going to excite the football, the fans, and, you know, and that's obviously uh, for myself as a coach. The last time Buono served as both head coach and GM of the BC Lions, he guided them to a great cup. Emily Murray in Surrey for BCIT Magazine. 
This week we bring you the first in a series of special features on BC Amateur Sport, produced in partnership with Via Sport. Up first, we take a look at wheelchair curling. Their provincial championships were held recently in Richmond. Our reporter Colton Davies brings us more. Finding wheelchair curling, you know, is just one of those sports that you don't need a whole bunch of extra equipment. Um, it's it's easy to get involved, like I said, because you can just uh, join in with your friends and families. It's the same as normal curling um, without sweepers. You know, same four positions, same eight rocks. If you want to get into curling, you you buy a stick, warm clothes, which you probably already got and uh, you have you know ice fees for the year so a couple hundred dollars and you're in. Every curling club can have wheelchair curling integrated into any of their leagues and it's totally an integratable sport. There are some curlers here I noticed who have just started this yep. year, some wheelchair right. curlers and they were all telling me why didn't they know about it before they're having such fun. Nice throw! What VIA Sport is doing for us is huge because you're getting this sport out there where it needs to be, what we want are more people playing, and they'll see how much yeah. that we as coaches and the players really enjoy this sport. It really is an inexpensive sport, and the social interaction that you get is phenomenal. If you're in a wheelchair, you can be 17 or you can be 70. If you have your upper body strength to push the rock, away you go. We want to make the shot first, and we did. It's so really nice to have a team dynamic and see how a team works and see what you can accomplish as a, as a team. I love it. I love curling. When you're out on the ice throwing rocks and doing what you love, every all, all the other problems fall away for sure. And you're out there with like-minded people too. And so, yeah, you feel like you belong and, and that, you're, 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 that the chair is a non-issue anymore. It's just who you are. If you have any questions or comments regarding this program, please visit us online at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitbroadcastnews.ca. I'm Chris Bruntlinger-Grant. And I'm Tara Harvey. That's today's BCIT Magazine. Thanks for watching.